much better. I'll be in the very wet week, and then when the sun is out, and the things are out, that's just a perfect coffee name. Um, I have a few announcements. Offering this Sabbath is for the Washington youth, and for the next Sabbath, it is, uh, it is for a global church project. A small change, uh, there won't be a communion bread making demo today. Our demoist, or demo word, however you could say that, is a little bit under the weather, and she requested that we move it back to January 26. Uh, also, it's ongoing, uh, every married couple uh, is encouraged to pray a minimum of five minutes a day. If you uh, need more information about this, please go to the Washington Conference website for more information. Uh, we mourn the passing of uh, Nana Nivellas, uh, just one of the, uh, I would call, founding members of this church. Um, she was the head uh, uh, deaconess for a number of years, um, and uh, um, we mourn her passing. Uh, the service, there's a service on January 19th. Viewing starts at uh, 12 in the afternoon, and the morning service at 1.30, and then the internment at 3 o'clock. Uh, with Alaska and Hawaii wide that closed, shut down permanently, uh, we should plan on how we are going to go there. Uh, on a good day, uh, when the wide uh, was open, it takes us about 35, 40 minutes to get there from here. And uh, with uh, the traffic congestion because of the global closure, uh, we probably should uh, uh, leave earlier and encourage the uh, church leader to uh, please um, plan what we're going to do that day. Uh, we may have to skip Sabbath school, I don't know, that's just, a, uh, that's just something that uh, I want to throw out there. Uh, nobody seemed to... Uh, so let's, uh, let's uh, gather maybe uh, after the Sabbath and plan what we're going to do that day. I'm guessing maybe Rene uh, can give us a better, uh, those who came from the north, maybe they can give us a better um, um, understanding or view of what the traffic looks like. If, if you leave early enough, the traffic is pretty light, but if you leave late, of course, it's going to be harder on How many, uh, how long do you expect? You know, at that, that time, time, at around 11, 11, 30, how, uh, how long or how long do you think we'll get us there? Around 11, 11, 30? I think it would be better be, during that time because of the traffic. Usually everyone is, is now at work. And so that time is going to be a little bit better than, say, I think it's 8 or 9 o'clock uh, hour. Because between the 6 o'clock and the 9 o'clock hour, it's a Saturday. It's a Saturday. Saturday. Yeah, it's a Saturday. It's a Saturday. Saturday. It's a Saturday. It's a Saturday. Like I said, the earlier the better too on Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. Well, Saturday uh, going north from here is um, a little bit uh, back up. Because um, uh, we go uh, Highway 5 south and we see the opposite uh, direction uh, always packed. Uh, yeah, so maybe uh, after after, uh, after Pala, maybe a few of us should sit down and plan uh, what we're going and the plan we're going to do that day and make suggestion make a suggestion for the pastor. Um, so who would like to, to be uh, who would like to be on that? Uh, Mario, um, Janelle, maybe Renee, um Dilo. Um let us uh, let us uh, let's spend a few minutes and plan how can we how can and think about what we're gonna do uh, next hour uh, because I think uh, um, Leaving here, if we do our normal service, uh, we will make it on time. Uh, does any, uh, anybody have some announcements to make? Okay, uh, none. Uh, let's uh, call on our uh, praise team to uh, get us ready for the uh, second service. Thank you.
have done. We're here to worship you. You are God. And when we stop and think about the fact that you took a day and invited us to your presence, our words today talk to your presence and that we have learned more of you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, little boys, little boys and girls, come on up, and on your way up, please stop by your aunts, uncle, Lola's, and Lola's, and receive their offering for our building fund. And after that, Ate Sophia will be giving you a, uh, I'm sure, a wonderful children's story. Happy Sabbath, boys and girls. Okay, today our story will be called Wisdom of the Wise. Day by day, year after year, there flowed from Solomon's bright, keen mind a river of wisdom. He spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. No doubt he had a scribe or secretary to write down his wise sayings as he thought of them. Many are to be found in the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Here is some of his good advice for students. If thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest
with us, everyone. Our, our offering today will be for the Washington New, new Purpose, New Branding. So began, so began a new emphasis on the Washington Conference Advanced Offering in 2018 with a new name and a new focus. Washington Youth Offering emphasized the children, youth, and young adults in our congregations and in our communities. On the fourth Sabbath of each month, different conference departments serving our youth were featured for special emphasis. Your gifts labeled Washington Youth went towards resourcing the initiatives of the SIG designated um, ministry to reach our children, youth, and young adults for Jesus. In addition to the monthly Sabbath offering, all gifts throughout the month labeled Washington Youth went toward the designated department. Thank you for generously supporting Washington Conference desire to place our children and youth front and center in our allocations of time and resources. Our Washington Youth emphasis in January is for Adventist Christian education, which provides excellent learning for the, this life and preparation for life eternal. On the second Sabbath of, Jan of 2019, it is still not too late to begin the new year right. As we embark on this 12-month journey with God, let's determine to faithfully put, his, put Him first in our financial priorities. True to His promise, He will open for you the windows of heaven and blessings. Malachi 3, verse 10. Let us all pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this Sabbath. Thank you for allowing us to worship you today. Please bless our tithes and offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The scripture reading for today is Psalms 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. For those who are able, please kneel with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that the sun is out. Um, help Pastor as he preaches your word today and help the people who are sick to get better and bless Lolo, Lola Salome as she's in rest. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Our speaker today is uh, Christian Reeves. I believe he's spoken here before. Uh, he is an IT engineer that, is, that works for a company that is based on, in Alaska, Anchorage, Alaska. Christian is blessed to be married to a wonderful young lady who has completely captured his heart. 
His home is full of joy and laughter thanks to his 15-year-old baby boy, both Christian and his wife, Shia. Is that how you pronounce it? Uh, were raised in loving Christian, uh, uh, loving Seventh-day Adventist home. It is the aim of Christian and Shia to carry the torch handed to them by their parents and raise their boy to love and serve the Lord. Christian and Shia consider themselves to be lay workers in the Lord's church. It is their prayer that they can exemplify Jesus to their community. Uh, before we receive the message from uh, Christian, I'd like to offer him a uh, like short prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for sending us Christian, and uh, thank you for um, <clears throat> giving us this opportunity that we can listen to your message, open our hearts and mind, that uh, we may receive uh, the, the message that you've impressed Christian to deliver to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm happy to be here with you again. I was here once before. Do you remember me? Really? Do you remember what I preached about? <laughs> and the bicycle. <laughs> yes, well... Specifically, that we have a foe that goes about as a roaring lion. Is that right? But we have a God who can shut the lion's mouth. I am glad to be with you today. I enjoyed the hymn we sang, Joy by and by. Oh, there'll be joy when the work is done. When I was younger... Every summer I'd go back to the Midwest, I should summer sometimes, usually more fall time, and I would help on farms there with harvest. And my, my job was, I drove a, a very, very large tractor pulling what's called a grain cart. It's a big, big square trailer that goes behind the tractor, the tire's about this tall, because we were harvesting in the sand hills of Nebraska. And it's the, those sand hills, if you take a semi-truck out in the hills, you'll get stuck. So what you do is somebody who drives the tractor pulling the grain cart goes out to the combine, which is doing the harvesting. And the combine is you, you, you pull up beside it. Now you're driving right where it had already been harvested and you're on the left side of the combine. And there's what's called an auger on the combine and it swings out over the top of my grain cart, and while the combine is still in motion, harvesting, I'm driving right beside the combine, and he's dumping his load into my grain cart. And then I would rush it back to either a grain bin, if it, we were that close, or a grain truck. While I'm doing that, the second grain cart is, is headed back to the combine before the combine uh, is full and has to stop. The goal is to never let the combine stop. And as I would do that, we would sometimes look at the weather and we would see that rain was coming. And when rain's coming and it's harvest time, your hours just got longer because you need to harvest all you can before the rain comes. And I remember a few times it was about midnight or one in the morning and the dew hadn't yet fallen, so it was still dry enough to harvest and so we were still at it. And I was having to keep myself awake, so I would start singing songs, and I would sing, Oh, where are the reapers? Oh, who will come? And I'd sing, Work for the night is coming, when man's work is done. And then I would also sing, Joy by and by, oh, there'll be joy when the work is done. You know, we all have a work to do, don't we? And as I look at the work that you and I have to do, I sometimes wonder, how are we going to get it done? Because if I were to be honest with you, and that's always the best policy, I don't think we're doing too good. So today I'm going to preach a little bit on ways that we can hopefully do better. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, I pray you'll be with us as we open your word. Show us what we can do to get the work done. 
I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, it was pointed out to me, and I don't, I, I don't know if I submitted the title of my sermon with a typo or where the typo came in, but there's a, there is a typo in, this, in the sermon title, Why We Can't Sell the Gospel. I don't mean sale as in put it on sale, you know, discount it. It's too good. You don't need to discount it. Don't do that. But I do need to sell it to people. There's a lot of people don't know about the gospel, and I got to make the sell. I got to go up to them, and I got to convince them. Now, if you listen to salesmen who have had great success, and they'll give their seminars, how to close a sale, how to be an effective salesman. You know one thing a lot of them will say? They'll say that every one of us, whether we want to or not, we're all into sales. It's true. I don't have an occupation. I mean, I don't get paid to sell something. That's not what I do. But I'm into sales, and you're into sales. If you buy a, a car, brand new, and by the time that car's reached 20,000 miles, your engine's already gone out, your transmission has gone out, your steering is wobbly. You've sold me on not buying that car. You've made the sale. Not, I'm not buying it. Convinced. You've done the job. But here's the interesting thing about us being salesmen for the gospel. I often hear comments. People will say something like, well, yeah, I need to, I need to try sharing Christ more. Or, yeah, I should... I should try to talk to my neighbors. You know, I make those kind of comments too, so I'm not being judgmental of those who make comments, and I'm sure you've all made them too. But doesn't that already sound a little defeatist right out, right off from the start? Well, I should probably try to, you know, tell people. What an enthusiastic salesman you are. You know, it's interesting, I, I'm the, uh, my personality, so a little bit about me, uh, people who get to know me often know that I'm a bit of an extremist. I either like something, and I like it really well, I mean, I just love it, I just want it all the time, like my wife, I mean, just fantastic, I just, <laughs> wonderful, oh, fan just great, I just... You know, I mean, I talk about it all the time. I just love it. Or I don't like it at all. It's not, there's no, I don't tend to find middle ground. I just shun it. I want to have nothing to do with it. Just, ah, uh, it's not, not for me. I tend to put everything in one of two categories. And, you know, the category of the things that I like, I've been surprised how many people end up around me start liking those things too. You know, uh, I wonder, what is it? Why is it that the people I'm around start liking these things? But you know why? Because I make the sale. And I'm not even trying. I never say, well, yeah, I, you know. I think this kind of vehicle is better. I wonder if I should tell somebody. You know, I wonder if I could help people get a better car. That's not the way I do. I come, someone says, hey, I'm looking to buy a car. What do you think? And I say, Aha, I can tell you just what to do. I can tell you what's going to work for you. I, I've got the solution. You're going to love it. It drives so nice. It's economical, really good gas mileage. Maintenance costs are low, and it looks nice stylish and they say wow that's pretty nice that sounds good what's your recommendation and i can tell them. but you see that's the way i tend to be about things i tend to i tend to really like it and when you talk to me about it i'm going to be enthusiastic even things that don't make sense for example i grew up out in the country and so even though i'm an it engineer i grew up way out in the mountains i have some of that mindset still in me i grew up wearing a pair of boots every day. That's what I wore. 
And now the only day of the week I don't wear a pair of boots is Sabbath still to this day. I'm an IT engineer and I go to work wearing a pair of boots. Because I'm telling you, they're way better in shoes. I can convince you they're better. If you saw my boots, listen, I want to tell you something. I had my boots custom made in Spokane, Washington. I went straight to that factory. A factory rep came out. He measured my foot exactly. And those boots fit me perfect. Now, I work in an office, so I had them put a toe cap on the boot. And they look a little bit nice, and I keep them polished. So nobody usually knows that I'm wearing a full-on pair of boots. And you know what? That's not considered the stylish thing. But I now have coworkers that are wanting to drive all the way to Spokane and buy those boots. <laughs> and I don't blame them. They are the best. <laughs> now, I wonder if I approach sharing the gospel this way, what would happen? If it was just natural for me when I saw somebody to say, hey, I think you got a problem. And I got an answer. Let me tell you about my God. What if I approached sharing the gospel this way? What would happen? Our scripture reading is, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. What I'm going to make a case for, and where's the clock around here? Right there, okay. What I'm going to make a case for this morning is that the reason we don't share the gospel this way with enthusiasm. I mean, we should witness without it even real. We shouldn't even think, oh, it's time to witness. It should just happen. The reason we don't do that, I don't think you and I have really tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And when you and I taste and see that the Lord is good, That experience will put an enthusiasm in you and me. And I can just imagine the next time I come here, I mean, you're going to be, you know, your car's going to be dragging low because it's so full of people. And you can say, yeah, yeah, this person, I met him at the bus stop, told me about a problem, and I said, hey, come on, ride on over. We're going to help you out. And he was so convinced that he came to see us today. Oh, yeah, this person, this is a coworker. You know, he's had trouble with his marriage. He's had trouble with addictions. He's had trouble with anger. And I heard about it, and I said, hey, I know just what to do to help you out. And so he's here today. I can just imagine that that's what's going to be, that's how this place is going to get filled up. It's because you and I are going to have that enthusiasm because we're going to first taste and see. One of the most famous salesmen in the U.S. was a salesman by the name of Zig Ziglar. Anybody heard that name? He tells a story I heard uh, 10 or 15 years ago, and I still remember it. I tried, I, I, it came to mind when I was preparing the sermon, and I tried to find it, and I couldn't find it. So I could have the details just a little bit wrong, but it stuck out to me so much I remember it pretty well. At the time, Zig Ziglar was in the business of selling kettles. And he'd work with his fellow salesmen, and they were all trying to bring their sales numbers as high as they could. But one guy in particular was really struggling. He tried and tried. I mean, people would come in, and he'd, hey, look at this kettle. Thicker stainless steel than the competitors. We've got uh, more durability. It's more heat-treated. And he'd try to make a sale, but it never worked. So finally one day he came up to Zig Ziglar and he said, boy, Zig, I don't know. What are we going to do? Uh, I don't know if this is going to work out for me. I can't even, you know, my sales are so low, my commissions are so low, I'm not paying my bills. What do you think I could do to get my, my sales up a little bit? Zig Ziglar looked at him and he said, let me ask you. Have you yet bought a set of these kettles? Well, not yet. I do want to. He said, I do think they're the best. I mean, I really, that's why I sell them. I think they're the best, but I just don't have the money. I, I'm making so little right now, I can't afford these kettles. I just need to know how to get my sales up, and then I'll, 
I'll buy a set of them myself. Zig Ziglar said, I'll tell you what. I think if you buy a set of these kettles, your sales are going to go up. He said, well, he said, I, I, I really can't. I don't have the money. And Zig Ziglar said, I'll tell you what. We'll get you set up on a payment plan. You buy these kettles. You take them home. And he did. And did you know in two weeks, he had made so many sales, he'd paid off his kettles and caught up on his bills. That's because he had experienced for himself. You see, you and I need to taste and see that the Lord is good. Why do we need to taste and see that the Lord is good? Well, think of our senses. My wife makes a kind of pudding that you've probably never heard of or never tried. It's garbanzo bean pudding. You ever heard of that? (laughs) Never heard of that, have you? Great. I wanted something you'd never heard of. Now, I could come to you and I could say, hey, listen, guys, my wife makes the best garbanzo bean pudding. It is just the right creaminess. The flavor is... See, you could use like a soybean base, soy milk base if you wanted, but uh, soybeans, it's kind of hard to get that beanie flavor out, but our garbanzo bean, now that is the flavor to go. If you want a bean base, go for a garbanzo bean, forget the soy milk, get a garbanzo bean milk, you can flavor it, and it is, it's so pleasant. And I could tell you all about it. You could hear with your ears me tell you about it. I could say it's, it's not white, it's kind of an off-white. It has a, mm, a soft feel in the mouth. It's not overly sweet. It's just the right amount. It goes, it's a great topping for fruit. And I could go on and on, but do you really know what that garbanzo bean pudding is like? Of course you don't. So now, now I could go a little further. I could say, okay, all right, I got You've heard about it, but that doesn't do it. Now... I'm going to bring a bowl of it out. So I bring a bowl of it out, and I show you all. Like, look. Everybody look at this garbanzo bean pudding. Have you seen a pudding that tastes this good ever? Look. Well, could you really answer that? Well, why not? You've heard about it, and you've seen it. But you still don't know, do you? So I could say, okay, 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 I got it. You don't know. I'm going to actually pass it around because maybe some of you are a little leery of the consistency. Is it sticky? Is it gooey? I'd be kind of yuck. I'd say, okay, I'll put that all at ease. I'll bring the bowl around and all of you can touch it. Touch, 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 touch. touch. And everybody touches their garbanzo bean pudding. Now, do you know what that garbanzo bean pudding is like? No, you don't. But you've heard about it and you've seen it. And you've touched it. Now you can say, okay, I'll, top, I'll really top it off now. I'm going to bring this bowl of pudding right up underneath your noses. Every one of you. I'll just bring it up. And you can smell it. And it does smell good. It smells really good. And you'll smell it. And you'll, you'll get the scent of that, of that subtle vanilla flavor. Oh, it might make you a little hungry. And you might be a little more sold on it now than you were before, but do you really know what it's like? No, you don't know what it's like yet. But if I give you all a little bowl of it and you eat it, now you know what it's like. You know what it tastes like. You know how it feels in your tummy because you've eaten it of all the senses you see tasting is the most important because to taste first you need to get it past your senses if it stank do you think you'd let it in your mouth no what if you poked on it and it was as hard as a rock would you let it in your mouth no what if when i showed it to you it it just looked like refried beans and it's supposed to be pudding. Would you let it in your mouth? No, you wouldn't. But after it's passed, all those other senses, your faith is pretty high that this is going to be good. It looks good. It sounds good. 
it smells good, it feels good, and now you taste it, and it tastes so good. You see, I wonder how many of us, our Christian experience is not based on tasting and seeing that the Lord is good, but it's hearing somebody else talk about their experience with the Lord. Well, I heard brother so-and-so. What a story. That touched me. And it can. You can see with your eyes somebody go through a trial and come out strong. Well, that's a blessing to see. But does it really count if your experience with the Lord is based on what you've seen, heard, and touched? No, you've got to taste. You've got to take it in. And furthermore, tasting is an interesting thing. Because once you eat a bite of food, you take it in, you, mm, you chew it, it's so pleasant to your mouth, then you swallow, it goes down to your stomach, and from your stomach it goes into your small intestine, and right there, little molecules, one by one, so tiny your eye could never see them, is absorbed in to your body. And and the nutrients then are fully assimilated and used. You see, to eat something is really an act of partaking. It's an act of, of full involvement. To take that in. Here's an example. If you have your Bible, turn to Revelation. Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10 in verse 9. Now this is John. You've been getting an introduction to John in our, in our quarterly this quarter. Now listen to what he was told to do. So unusual. Revelation 10 verse 9. I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. Do what with it? eat a book? Was, was John really supposed to literally take a book and chew that paper? No, of course not. No. See, he was supposed to take the message of that book and was to fully embrace it, was to fully take it in and to take the meaning of those words and to pl apply them completely to his life because that's what our body does with food. It's a complete intake. Isn't it an interesting example? Here's a few more. Uh, if you have your Bible, let's turn to Psalms 119. Psalms 119, verse 103. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Have you ever tasted a word? Like somebody said something, you go, oh, that, that word tasted better than the last one I heard. <laughs> you know, oh, that tasted good. Well, no, of course not. That's not the meaning. But the Bible, you'll find there's many examples where it talks about taste, eat, because that represents a full embrace Let's look at one more. Now, if this isn't the ultimate example of a full embrace, I don't know what is. Let's turn to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. You see, Jesus didn't see death for you or hear about death for you. He tasted death for you. Every man, he tasted. That means he experienced death. He fully embraced death for you and me. So now that we've thought about 
tasting and seeing that the Lord is good? How do we do that? How do we taste and see the Lord is good? I'm going to read to you just a few little excerpts I found while studying. These are all written by a writer named Ellen White, who is a very gifted with words, much more so than I. So I'm just going to read to you for a minute, and maybe something in these little excerpts I took out of some of her writings will give you some ideas. There is evidence that is open to all, the most highly educated and the most literate, the evidence of experience. God invites us to prove for ourselves the reality of his word, the truth of his promises. He bids us taste and see that the Lord is good. Instead of depending upon the word of another, we are to taste for ourselves. And as we draw near to Jesus and rejoice in the fullness of his love, our doubts and darkness will disappear in the light of his presence. To taste, we need to start drawing nearer to Jesus. How shall we know for ourselves God's goodness and his love? The psalmist tells us, not here and now, read and know. Sorry, not hear and know, read and know, or believe and know, but taste and see that the Lord is good. Instead of relying upon the word of another, taste for yourself. So everyone may be able, through his own experience, to set his seal to this, that God is true. He can testify, I needed help, and I found it in Jesus. Every want was supplied. The hunger of my soul was satisfied. I believe in Jesus because he is to me a divine savior. I believe the Bible because I found it to be the voice of God to my soul. Friends, we need to taste. How do we taste and see? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. If so be that you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, how do we taste, question mark, by humbling our souls before God and seeking him with our hearts. You see, we need to taste. Have you ever tried feeding somebody who had already just eaten? My great-grandmother used to cook for the threshing crews. There was no self-propelled combine at that point, like I got to use in later years. It was a threshing machine. A lot of hand work. With a threshing machine, you have a machine that would go through, cut the wheat, put it into bundles. You would then come along with your pitchfork, pitch the bundle, throw it into a wagon. If you were lucky enough to have a tractor, it would be pulled the wagon would be pulled by a tractor, but my, grandma, my great-grandmother started this before tractors, so it was horses that were coming along pulling the wagons, and you would pitch the bundle of wheat into the wagon. Then the wagon was pulled up to the threshing machine, and a crew would stand there pitching bundles of wheat onto the conveyor belt of the threshing machine. And you would work so hard that when lunchtime came around, let me tell you, it could be anything, and you were so glad to eat. My grandmother used to say she would rather feed 12 hungry people than one that wasn't. Sometimes I wonder how the Lord puts up with us because we don't act very hungry. You notice what he said on the Sermon of the Mount, if you want to turn there. Matthew chapter 5, he gave quite an interesting blessing. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. If you want to know how to taste and how to have a full tummy, you first got to get hungry. Because the Lord just said here when he preached this wonderful Sermon on the Mount that those who are hungry shall be filled. You see, the first thing you and I need to do is we got to get hungry. You know, this 
Last uh, Christmas and New Year's, I was in Montana with my wife's family. And uh, I've developed a habit, for right now anyway, where I don't eat a third meal in the evening, just because uh, it's a long story, but a few years ago I was skiing and unexpectedly went off a cliff and, and took an ambulance ride to the hospital and was in pain for the next several years. And uh, I, I, was in, I was injured to the point and in enough pain that exercise was just not an option. And I had used to be very active before that. I did a lot of biking, running, uh, hiking. I liked exercise, but that was out. And I found that in a fairly short amount of time, for the first time in my life, my weight started going. You know, I never could get it on before, but all of a sudden it dawned on me that it hadn't been very long and I'd gained 30 pounds. Hmm. So I said, okay, <clears throat> part of this is I've, and then I stopped gaining, but some time ago I told my wife, I said, okay, I got to get this 30 pounds that I had gained. I want to get it back off. So I went to two meals a day and I've become very comfortable with two meals a day. But when we were in Montana with my wife's family, it's a large family, sisters and brothers, and there's other babies, and there's nursing mothers, and there's people that really need a third meal. Well, I'm a social type, so I would help prepare a third meal, and then I would sit down. I wouldn't really eat much, you know, kind of the avenue thing, a little popcorn, and, you know, an apple, and, you know, just not. I was kind of just a, really a social eater. I wasn't there because I was hungry. That's not what God's looking for. He's not looking for you and I to come here and say, well, I kind of, yeah, sure. You know, I'm here because my friends are here, so maybe there's a blessing. No, 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 no. He's looking for you to be hungry, hungry for righteousness. He wants you to taste because he knows when you taste, that's that's it. You're going to just keep tasting. You're going you're gonna to eat a meal. He wants you to be hungry. So how do we do this? And how does this fit in with selling the gospel anyway? Well, think about it, friends. We go to work. We tell our coworkers we're Christians. But then they see us get impatient. That's unfortunate. They see us get angry. We feel like somebody slandered us and we're ready to mm, get them back. And when Bob isn't around, we all gossip about him. And they see you gossip about Bob. And it's nasty. It doesn't look good. And you know what? No wonder we can't sell the gospel. We're not that attractive. We go home and they watch us around our families and we get impatient with our wife. And then we yell at our kids. And they walk into our houses and we're just sloppy. We don't look like we have anything to live for. Well, no wonder we can't sell the gospel. What do we have to show for? You see, but if you and I will recognize these areas in our life, maybe it's a temperament issue. Maybe when you were young, you were mistreated, you had to fend for yourself, and you developed a fighting spirit. And it doesn't take long because you have a short fuse to set you off. And you know it, but you don't know what to do about it. I'll tell you, taste and see. You get on your knees and you say, Lord, I'm here on this Sabbath afternoon, and I'm not getting off my knees till I get a taste of how you're going to help me with this. The Lord's just been waiting for you to come, begging for a taste. He'll give you one. You can say, Lord, I'm here now. I haven't done wrong with my finances. I haven't paid my tithe, and I know it's wrong. Lord, I'm not getting off my knees till you show me what to do. I want to honor you with my finances. And I'm here. Give me a taste. You could say, Lord, I don't know how to show love to my spouse. I want to be a husband that leads by example. 
It shows Christ-like love. I want to give of myself for the betterment of my family, but I don't know how to do it. I'm caught up with myself. Lord, I'm not getting off my knees till you give me some help. And he'll say, I'm so glad you came for a taste. I'll give you one. That's how you get a taste. You draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Let's turn to James. That's where that's from. James chapter 4. Boy, this is some practical knowledge for a Christian, so listen up. James chapter 4. We'll start in verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Boy, that's what we need. We need him to be running, because run- he has been working us and making a joke out of us for too long. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, here's the, the hey, this all goes together. It then follows right up with, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves. This is verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Do you want a taste? I hope you want a taste. I'm not trying to be rude, but you need a taste. And I need a taste. We need, to sh- we need to live a life that shows what happens when Jesus has come in. We need to eat. We need to let his words, his examples, his truths fill our body and permeate it as if it were food. We need a taste. I don't, where's my bulletin? I don't remember what time I'm supposed to be done. Oh, it doesn't say. Somebody help me out. Give me a taste. What, what time? Okay, I'll tell you what. We'll, we'll wrap it up maybe with a story or two. Um, yeah, let's, let's have a story. This, this first story, it's a good thing. My, do you remember when I was here last time? I started telling stories that scared my son. He had to leave. <laughs> I've preached since I was here last time, and I... I haven't really been telling stories because he can't quite take it yet. But he's not in here, so here we go. Um, <clears throat> this was some time ago back when, the, back when the Dust Bowl blew through the Midwest, hit Kansas, Nebraska. You all heard about that? My grandfather, that was the time when he and his siblings packed up from Nebraska and moved to Portland. And my family has been in the west coast ever since but there was a family during the dust bowl and it was so hard your crops failed it was so dry and the dust would blow in and that dust was so dry and so fine it would get in through the cracks of the door and it'd come in your house and you'd come into your kitchen and your counter was just dusty You'd try your best to keep dust out of the water, but, oh, here comes my boy. I don't know if this is going to work. But try your best. You'd open the water pot, and there it was, a layer of dust. And farmer after farmer went bankrupt. In one family, they had four children, two boys, 16 and 17. And then two younger girls, eight and nine. And the poor father of that family had to make one of the hardest calls of his life. One day he called his boys in. He said, boys, I hate to do this. But I'm just not making any money anymore. I can just barely feed your mother and your two sisters. I can't make enough to feed you anymore he said boys this really breaks my heart but I'm going to have to tell you something you're going to have to go you're going to have to go fend for yourselves I can't take care of you here 
You're going to have to just do what you can. But I wish, I wish you boys best. Well, those two boys, George and William, they said, Dad, they were such men at young age, they said, Dad, no problem. We totally understand. We know how hard it's been for you, and we just want to tell you, don't worry about us. We will be able to take care of ourselves, and we understand the decisions you're having to make. Well, George and William went to pack up their things, and their mother, brokenhearted, came into their room. With tears in her eyes, she said, boys, promise me something. She said, promise me that you will never take the name of the Lord in vain. Do not ever swear. Boys looked at her, their mother and they said, okay, mother, we promise, we promise. And she said, boys, I want you to promise me that you will never drink or smoke. Don't let that stuff come in your body. Don't get addicted to it, boys. So many people that you'll be around are going to be addicted, and they're going to push you to do this. There'll be so much peer pressure. Boys, please, don't drink or smoke. The boy said, okay, mother, we promise. We will never drink or smoke. And she said, promise me that you'll never kill somebody or do a terrible thing like that. Okay, mother, we promise. And George and William packed up their few belongings and started down that dusty road. And as they walked, one day and then another day, they eventually came to this large ranch. There was a big sign, Steward's Ranch. And they said, well, maybe we should go in here. Maybe we could get a job here. Looks like things are still happening here. So the two boys went up. And they found old Mr. Stewart, and they said, uh, excuse me, sir, we're looking for a job. Would you happen to have a job here? Well, yeah, sure, he said, uh, I'll tell you what, uh, yeah, you can come to work here. You'll get uh, room and board and uh, 50 cents a week. That'll be enough to buy your chewing tobacco. And they said, oh, that's all right, sir, we don't, we don't chew. He said, well, whatever, then you can just put it in your back pocket. Well, those two boys went to work, and I'm telling you, they applied their mind to their work. What their hand found to do, they did it with all their might. And they worked so hard. When it was time to bring in the hay, they would bring in the hay. Time to round up the cows, they'd round up the cows. Those boys gave it their best. And one day, old Mr. Stewart came riding in to the bunkhouse there where all the boys stayed. And, all the, and he, he rode up, and he said, oh, boys! It's been a great day. I made a bunch of money. I'll tell you what, boys, you all come on down. We're going to go into town, and we're going to get something to drink. Come on, boys, let's all go. We'll all just go together. And they loaded up, and they started into town to get something to drink. But George and William promised they'd never drink. And so they all rode on their horses into this western town, pulled up to the tavern there, and the boys started to hitch their horses. And Mr. Stewart had jumped off and he hitched their, his horse. But George and William, oh no. They figured they'd just ride on down the street a little ways. Maybe go to the general store, get a little something to eat. Spend the day in the park, play horseshoe. But right before they left, old man Stewart came up. George! Yes? You make me leave here at 5 o'clock, okay, George? Okay, he thought, oh, great. Five o'clock, he'll be drunk. I don't want to try making him do anything. He said, now, George, I might be a little drunk, and I might be a little cantankerous, but you make me leave. Do you promise me? Okay, he thought, boy, that boy, that old Mr. Stewart's got pretty big fist. I wonder how this is going to go, try making him leave at five o'clock. But that was all there was to it. Old man Stewart and all the other boys went into the tavern. Well, George and William went down to the general store and they got a little slice of cheese and they got some bread and they got a few things and they went out around the corner and they found a little park, some horseshoes, and they put a, an old mat down and they ate their picnic and they got up and played horseshoe. And then they, oh, 
the sun felt so good they just laid down to, to stretch out a little bit. Oh, they knew they wouldn't lose track of the time. The old town and the clock would call out the hour. Pretty soon they heard bong, bong, bong. William said, George, it's three o'clock. Don't forget to get old man steward in two hours. Oh, why don't you come with me, William? Oh, no, 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 not me. <laughs> I don't want to get hit by his fist. Huh. Well, they played another round of horseshoe and then bong, 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 bong. Hey, George, said William, it's four o'clock. You've got to remember in one hour, you've got to go get old man Stewart. Oh, I know. Oh. Well, then it happened. Bong, 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 bong. Hey, George, it's five o'clock. You better, you better go get old man Stewart. Oh, William, don't you just think you could come with me this time? Uh, no, no, <laughs> I'm not, no, I'm not going. Well, George got on his horse, and he rode over to the tavern. And it was one of these taverns with a split door. There was a lower door that was closed and an upper one that was open. And George looked in there, and he didn't see old man Stewart. And, oh, boy, I'm going to have to go in there. So he opened the door, and he walked in. He walked through the main room over to a door that went to a second main room. And he looked in, and here's old man Stewart at a card table with his cowboy hat, scooping the change. Oh, wow, it's been a great day. Oh, this has been great, boys. I really beat you this time. Oh, wow, fantastic. I'll tell you what, boys, you all go get another round of, to drink. And George walked in and said, old man steward, it's 5 o'clock. Oh, it's 5 o'clock. Okay, well, I suppose we should get going on pretty soon. But I'll tell you what, you all go get something to drink, just another bottle of whiskey, and then we'll go home. Now, George made a little mistake. He should have just walked out. But he did a good thing in that <clears throat> he was so determined never to drink whiskey that it was his default. And without realizing it, he spoke up and said, well, not me. And Mr. Stewart looked at him and said, what do you mean, not you? And George said, oh, well, pardon me, Mr. Stewart. I promised my mother I'd never drink. Oh, a mama's boy we have here. You'll never drink, huh? Well, I'll tell you what, George, you'll drink if I tell you to drink. No, I won't. Yes, you will. You will drink if I tell you to drink, even if I have to bust out your teeth. I will make you a drink. Well, George got more determined. No, you won't. Yes, I will. And old man Stewart got mad, just red with anger. You'll drink if I tell you to drink, George. No, I won't. Well, George was pretty strong, too. And with that, old man Stewart flung himself at George, grabbed him with a bear's strength, and he started to tussle with George. Oh, boy. But George was a pretty strong boy, too. And here's working old man Stewart. And the two of them were just a tussling around that room while well, the other boys thought that was fun. Oh, yeah. Oh, make him drink, Stewart. Make him drink. Yeah, old man Stewart. Make him drink. The old man steward looked at one of the boys. He said, bring me that bottle of whiskey. And he brought him that bottle of whiskey. And he said, George, drink this whiskey. George said, no. And the old man steward was about ready to try to force him to drink that whiskey when George noticed something on the window seal right behind him. He noticed a six-shot revolver. Six-shot revolver. And you see, what they didn't know about George was that he was a crack shot. He could sh outshoot all of them, but they never knew that. And he grabbed that revolver and he said, Hands up, everybody! And old man Stewart, oh. He said, You're not going to make me drink. I will not drink. And if you don't believe I can shoot, I will shoot the cork out of that bottle. And he pointed at a bottle all the way across the room and went bang, and he shot the cork out of it and didn't break the bottle. And all those boys, oh, yeah, he can shoot. Whoa. Whoa. They and he said, you just try making me drink. But, you know, he had promised his mother he would never kill anybody or do a bad thing. 
And as he headed for the door of that main room into the first main room, he looked over and the tavern keeper was putting his hands down. He said, hey, you, put your hands up. You, the tavern keeper, okay. And George walked to the door. He opened the wheel of that revolver, knocked out the remaining rounds of ammunition, threw him in the room, set down the revolver, and went and got on his horse. Now, do you think old man Stewart came around the next day and said, Ah, oh, you lazy boy! You sure don't know how to stack hay. Oh, no. Good job, George. Very well. You really work hard. You're, you're a good boy, George. But do you know, George, because of his determination to follow the things of his mother, began to study his Bible. And he developed the most personable relationship with Jesus because he took the time to taste and see. And so George, though he could have been a very amazing at running his own ranch, became a preacher. And he'd travel out of the, on the hills of the west and he would see a cowboy and he'd say, hey, let people know I'm a preacher. I'm here to preach. Why don't you all gather around? And the cowboys would spread the word. And on the appointed time, they'd all ride out there to the hill where George was with their horses. And they'd dismount and they'd make a circle and George would preach. And after doing this for many years, George one day was preaching. And he was telling these old cowboys, he said, cowboys, God has changed my life. He's given me so much to live for. And what's wonderful is he's inviting all of you too. You all can have this same joy I do. If you give your heart to Jesus, your life will be better from this day forward. And there is an old crusty cowboy who had the scars of a life on the West. He had that hard look in his eye and his jaw was set. And he stood there and he listened to George preach that night. And afterward he came limping up, showing the injuries that he had experienced through his life. He came and he looked George right in the eye and he said, young man, and he started to weep. He said, you don't know. I've done way too many bad things. Jesus will never forgive me. He will never live in my heart. He won't. And George said, oh, old cowboy. You're just the one. Jesus was looking for. The old cowboy looked at George as he spoke and he said, he got, he hobbled up a little closer to him, looked at him, he said, young preacher, do I recognize you? George said, no, I've never, I've never met you before. I've never seen you anywhere. Preacher, did you used to work at Stewart's Ranch? And George said, well, yes. That was many, 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 many years ago. I was just a boy. I worked at Stewart's Ranch. And he looked right at George with that look in his eye where he was studying every mark on his face. He said, did you come in one night? Did you get old man Stewart out of a tavern? And he tried to make you drink? And you wouldn't do it? And you took that gun and you shot a cork out of a bottle and told us you wouldn't kill us? And George said, well, yes, I did. He said, I was that tavern keeper. When I was putting my hand down, I was going to grab a gun. And I'd already killed five people with that gun. And I intended on you being number six.
George sat down with that old cowboy and he put his hand on his shoulder and he opened the scriptures and right there he gave that cowboy a taste. And that cowboy was changed. I realize you and I have heard the gospel our whole life long. I realize that we maybe have forgot that Jesus has already promised to give us victory. I don't know your issues. I don't know what it is that you've held on to, what it is that in your heart makes you feel like Jesus will never live in your heart because you're not good enough. I don't know what it is. But I know that if you will this day go on your knees and say, Jesus, give me a taste. I'm not getting up till I get one. I want the victory over my anger. I want the victory. And I'm not going anywhere till you give it to me because you've already promised it to me and I'm here to claim it. You will get a taste. And let me tell you, when you get up off your knees, you'll never have to think again how you're going to sell the gospel. You're going to be going everywhere selling the gospel. You're just going to do it by default. And that, my friends, is how we get this work done. Oh, there's going to be joy when the work is done. Joy when the reapers gather home. And it's not getting done because we're not getting a taste. I'm going to ask you to think for a moment. If there's an area that you know you've never gained the victory, if you would now commit to go to your knees and to claim the promise of a taste, you will gain the victory. If you want to make the commitment to do that, I want to ask you just to raise your hand. Father in heaven, you see everyone here who says they're making a change now. That, that bad trait of character that's been plaguing them is now going to be handled by coming to you. They want to sit at your feet and they're going to stay there until you give them a taste of your goodness. Let them taste your goodness. And then may we all go up, salesmen, ready to sell the gospel, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand for our closing song? We'll be singing first, more than we
please help us to give all on the altar. All on the altar we'll lay. And then to one day, as the song said, be fellowship sweet with you. Please, today, give us a taste. Make us salesmen of the gospel. Compelling salesmen who can show the love of Jesus, the goodness of Jesus, the overcoming power of Jesus. Please make us your examples in Jesus' name.